So, um, the context. So, obviously, um, a like question that we're off. What's that? I like your mattresses. Yes, uh, this is actually a road from Sally Oak, which is the student town in Birmingham. Um, now, as you can see from the you know sort of conflict here between the university itself, which is clearly very pristine and very proper, and the community where students live in, there is a question of exploitation and also housing quality that is true to students in Birmingham, but also true to students across the country. Um, now, in the specific Birmingham context, what you have is a general rule when it comes to student housing are these you know terraced houses from the late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, the common problems within these are like twofold in nature. First, you have the problem with the way in which private housing works for students, and that is extremely temporary. Um, it's basically it sort of encourages an attitude of you know like consumerism, waste, and like a disposability to like your everyday life. And this can obviously be um, summed up in this pile of mattresses over here. Because if you're only living in a town for three years and the house you're living in is charging extortionate rent for a low quality room, where is the motivation to actually care about your community? Um, so obviously these are all photos of uh, various places within um, different houses. In fact, I went to a few of my friends' houses with these ones myself. That's the political thing, never mind. Who's the um, guy in the suit? It's Steve McKay, the local MP for Sunny Oak. <laughs> I stole off his website, don't tell anyone. Um, but this is a street in, our, in the student community. As you can see, you have like the trademark added extensions, the odd fridge, skips left around for whenever they want to turf out of the insides of a house and replace it with glossy new ones just in time for them to be ruined by the next batch of tenants. And you also have here my friend's house with penetrated damp all around the windowsills a room, a lovely bedroom there with mould and black rot, and a door panel which is so sodden that the actual side bit there, which you can't see very well, is falling off. Uh, these take from three different houses and I just thought a good cross section of the sort of quality you get with student houses in Birmingham. Um, so yeah, obviously these problems fall down into two main categories. One is maintenance and the other is like expenditure. There's really no motivation for a lot of landlords to bother to maintain their properties when they can simply gut them at the end of the year, replace them with another set of shiny but very cheap fittings, and then have another batch of students move in. So obviously this leads to problems with like everything from um, energy efficiency to black mould to general like health concerns. And landlords are obviously very unresponsive to these problems because why would you pay £700 for having them fixed when instead you can just collect rent for the rest of the year, paint it over and then you know, continue the cycle again. So. Um, the cooperative solution, which sounds more ominous than I meant it to. Um, this is, these are some photos of us throughout the last three years. This is three years ago, when we first got together, me and some of my friends. Um, and we thought, okay, let's try and start a student housing co-op. Let's see if that's a possible thing. Uh, we looked around at different models for like, you know, essentially um, ownership and self-control for students and for normal people as well. Uh, <laughs> well, I, at least I'm marking students out as the odd ones. <coughs> and um, we settled on the cooperative idea. <coughs> this is because of, yeah, you can have some water, sorry, I've got a bit of a cough. Um, so basically, what we thought would be that the, the key things to try and change the situation which students find themselves in in terms of housing was to basically change who controls the decisions when it comes to housing. Now obviously this is everything from maintenance to how tenants treat each other to how room and space and work is allocated. In a regular private lease for example, a uh, private tenancy rather, there is like no motivation for work around the house to be shared. If someone wants, doesn't want to clean up after themselves, well how on earth are you supposed to get them to, short of having a yell at them? Whereas with the cooperative idea, you have like um, essentially these points here. You have control, you have the long-term nature of the cooperative, you have the community which we, you can engage with and be part of rather than you know in and against. Um, you have democratic oversight, which of course means that decisions that can be made in such a way where they are accountable and can be you know discussed and debated properly. And you have the ability to actually change your living environment combined with, in our particular case, the desire to grow, as in to expand the cooperative, be that the property itself or into further houses and uh, units. And I believe that was the head of the ICA uh, a year ago, she came to the opening. This was our first batch of tenants, although our, these two here and here are just like actual members of the community who are friends of ours. So, And he was an intern from Ireland, he was lovely. Um, and this is the most recent grouping there on the right. As you'll notice, um, I'm 
I think I'm the only face that's continued since the start of it. Um, this is because one of the key things with students, of course, is that roughly and generally speaking, every few years you have a total turnaround of students, which can present, potentially present a bit of a problem for cooperatives, obviously. Um, our solution to this has been to basically run continuous training events, try and bring people up to speed, and as much as possible to share information and knowledge on how to manage the cooperative itself. Um, so this is how we've managed to deal with it. As well as this, many of the members of like the initial starting group are still living in our towns, in, in our local areas, and still come around and contribute and help when we need help, which is part of the whole community aspect. Uh, again, so we're fully neutral. Um, we do a, what we call a general meeting every week where we make all of our decisions on everything from what we might be wanting to buy that week in the shops to whether or not we're going to buy a new house. Um, these are one member, one vote meetings. Uh, they are, we, you know, we, we talk, we have a preset agenda, we debate, and we you know, can't pass anything unless we have a majority. It's, we don't you know, just take um, unilateral action. Um, we worked heavily with BCHS, and in particular Carl Taylor, in setting up the sort of cooperative itself and working around how to like, organize our meetings and our democratic process. And um, we also do meetings with the phone co-op, who obviously, who, well not obviously, um, who provided us with the uh, capital to get the house in the first place, and who we currently have a lease with, and we are building a surplus to start buying back houses. This is the like, model that we're working on, which we've seen so be successful in places like America, where you have like Berkeley, which has thousands of co-ops, students, which we run and organize in the exact same way. Again, this is a commitment to long-term development. Can I just stop you there? You might cover this. So, <laughs> They've um, also funded the one in Sheffield. Indeed, they have. So, are there any others in the pipeline? Um, so, as far as the phone call um, is concerned, that I don't, I don't know. Um, I know that they're willing. I believe they're willing to fund a new house for us in the next year, potentially, okay. um, providing that the house we decide that is good enough and, like you know, worthwhile for us to actually take on board. Because we don't want to just get a house because it's a house. We do actually, we do look to get somewhere where you know that's good, <laughs> qualitatively better. But um, I believe there's also there's Edinburgh Housing Cooperative, yeah. which um, started just after ours, so we still claim to be the first student housing cooperative in the UK, which I should premise on, we are not the first ever student housing cooperative in the UK, we are the first with a constitution that makes it exclusive to students and doesn't allow for it to become a regular housing cooperative when people graduate. This is something people have been very keen to point out on Facebook. Um, okay. Now there seems to be a weird problem here again, whereby the slides won't move forward. Okay, okay there we go. So, um, chores and organisation. So, what, like a lot of people would say, well, this isn't particularly important. You know, this is like this is just an internal matter. But we believe that it's actually very important that the work that goes into running a house on a day-to-day -day basis is shared equally amongst all members and organised in such a way that. It doesn't simply become a, I uh, want a better word, a hippie commune. Um, so how do we do this? Uh, that, that. So how do we do this? Basically, we, we organise all of our tasks um, on the basis of like their priority. Uh, things obviously like taking out the bins and cleaning, you know, like the kitchen and things like that are quite important that you do them on a regular basis. Other things like cleaning all the windows, not so much. We then attribute two people and you take on two tasks every week and we go through and this is how we organise work. Um, similarly, we have you know uh, largest contacts and like various different resources. So that if something does come up whilst we're at home, let's say I don't know the roof collapses, um, we can deal with it then and there, and we don't have to rely on waiting a week for someone to make those decisions. We are fairly, we try to be democratic as possible with these things, but obviously if you have an emergency, it needs to be dealt with. Um, you'll also notice this sign, this here, which will come into importance later. Yeah, so we have um, working groups. These are designed around different areas for running the cooperative. Everything from doing things like this, which is, you know, like a, would come under working with other cooperatives, to, um, what do you call it, our keep bookkeeping, our running the garden, our secretarial stuff. Oh, every single task associated with running a cooperative is divided amongst members equally so that we can make sure that everything we do is it doesn't fall on the heads of a few or people don't also decide Unless they have, a, of course, good reason to, to just totally strive off work, skive off work, rather. Um, it's also a great way of skill sharing because the problem, as I mentioned before, with you running a student housing cooperative is the fact that students circulate so fast. So, unless you engage as many people as possible with the process of learning and working, 
and how those skills are supposed to be shared. This is why we emphasize the need for everyone to work collectively. Uh, communal shopping is pretty much as simple as it says. Um, we have a cargo, or well, we have two cargo bikes, which are basically bikes which you can carry a mass of different things on. Uh, what we do is every week we buy, go to Aldi and the local market in Birmingham, where we buy all of our shopping for a week, which includes, of course, on Fridays where we do a large communal dinner with as many people, well, which are open to anyone, to be honest. You don't shop at the co-op? Um, no, <laughs> we don't shop at the co-op. Uh, there are reasons we don't shop at the co-op, which is primarily that we are running on a student budget and mm -hmm. can't actually really afford to do a weekly shop for that many people. Mm -hmm. This is the Probably decision. Probably having a challenge on that. I would be well welcome to. There is, there is, a, there is a large co-op near where we live. In terms of course, of, uh, it's from our point of view. It's you know, it's people like the phone co-op, people who shop with big counties who support the phone co-op, and you know, and then we might sound a bit geeky on the coffee world, but um, it is about you know, hopefully encouraging your generation to see that bigger picture, of supporting cooperatives as well. Well, we do believe in that. I mean, we work with a lot of cooperatives in our yes. area. Mm -hmm. the, the thing is that we have to balance what we can do with what we'd like to do. And there are que questions of like financial you know, consideration to make. I mean, we are, we're not workers. We don't have steady pay. We will run on student loans. We have a lot of students um, who do shop. I know, but it's like it, there, there are, we did make a decision on this. So, you know, we did have like a vote. We can change this at any point. Um, can you put it on the agenda again? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we do, it's not entirely fair to say we don't buy anything from the no. top, we yeah. do buy some goods from that, uh, especially Chris over here. Well, that deals often better than you get in the So, one thing, we, one thing we are working towards is um, shopping at Sumo collectively with another house down the road, mm -hmm. which will, because they do have similar prices to our current shop. Uh, one of the, yeah, the main reason, are, yeah, it's mainly just a house decision because of the, the price of, like, we get in a, obviously, the, the, the house we run is already reduced in price from typical uh, house for students in the area, but uh, one of the, or two of the key factors that we wanted to make sure of is that uh, students had one of the, that we wanted a, like, a low cost house for students, so it wasn't like exploitative and it wasn't unnecessarily like expensive. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously um, we want to cooperate as much as possible with other cooperatives and we do try and do that. Yeah. But we also do have to balance that with like democratic decision making and we can't allow one to override the other. We have to hold the two together. <laughs> so it's in, also I think, um, I think there, there could be a bit of a mistake in simply saying that you, you know, you say, okay, we'll shop at the cooperative, but therefore we won't shop at the local market. Therefore we won't, you know, the, the, this it shouldn't For really... Yeah, I, and I, I do think you, we should, and we should move towards that, but also there is a bit of a price war. That's something we'd like to get past, but we need to work out, and Sumer does seem to be the best way of doing this, and that's what we've committed to doing, and is an answer to that, which is a good thing, I think. But um, yeah, and also we, how we organise the social economy, get, get on the same for cost, is that every member of our cooperative pays £10 a week, and that covers all food and all supplies for the house. So if you can consider that in relation to prices if we were to shop elsewhere, that is extremely cheap and this is because we shop at the market and we shop at Aldi. We use Aldi for small staple goods like toilet roll and things like that. We use the market for all the fresh fruit and vegetables and we cook entirely vegetarian so that's the majority of our food comes from the market. Uh, you know, cooking, uh, yeah we do, we do, we split meals between all, um, all our members so different members cook on every different day. Uh, we also do on every Friday we do an open meal which we advertise and allow like, anyone to come in and go to that providing they abide by our court's rules around not being you know offensive or um, what do you call it? what drunk we don't actually have a rule banning that no. but obviously drunk <laughs> disorderly is a different question um, basically so long as someone isn't har isn't you know being <coughs> harassing or offending someone they are welcome to come around and eat with us and enjoy our company and get to know us and this has been a very good way of publicising the co-op and engaging with the wider student community but also a variety of people who aren't students who live in our local area and this is one of the main ways of our like forms of outreach we do. Do they pre-book with you? How do you know how many to cater for? Oh we just get them if I do. We're, we've, I mean, we, it ranges quite dramatically because it can, we've had between on the very quiet days around maybe ten or seven, 
to upwards of 30, 35, and it's like, Gosh. you can, we have a very large kitchen, and we are able to cater to that. The way you can usually gauge interest is people tend to be quite considerate and actually say, I'd like to come round today. It's very unusual for having a load of people just arrive and expect food without mentioning anything, or even asking if there's a, if there will be provisions. So, um, and we put it on our Facebook page, most people, you know, they all tend to comment on it or like it or like text us to say what time should I come around. There are, there are essentially, we seem to deal with it quite well. I don't think we've ever had a situation where we've had a load of people turn up and we've had to tell them to have some bread. Um, hopefully that won't arise. Uh, yeah, and this is just an example of that. Okay, uh, do you want to do this or I want yeah, to Yeah, sure. sure. Okay, so. Cool. Uh, so James has given a brilliant overview of uh, obviously the context of the house. Uh, just a quick mention, I was hoping that we could do like question and answer at the end so that we could do all of them like, you know, without getting a bit flustered. Mm -hmm. So if you guys have got questions, that would be great. <laughs> cool. So yeah, James has given a great uh, context and background to who we are, what we do and how, um, obviously why we've uh, come into existence in our particular scenario and obviously it's quite from a theme in our place in the country lots of students in fact almost every student we talk to definitely wants to uh, have some sort of house like this that they can live in as well so it's very desirable i'm just going to talk a bit more uh, before the end of the presentation uh, just a bit about more that goes on inside the house some more things that we do and you hopefully will take away that we're actually we are very very organized and very very uh, sort of ingrained in quite a lot of different things um, Around in our community. Oh, yeah, do you want me to do that? That's right, I'll yeah. just uh, do it. Bit mindful of the cables. Cool. So, oh, so I think we'll explain that to my side. So, yeah. I might go back to that. Um, so, yeah, uh, we try and encourage the use by our community for uh, quite a lot of things in terms of activism. We've got, we've had, um, I mean, we've got uh, like local uh, very um, uh, city uh, fossil free group that came around and did that poster. We also went on camp as well to try and get the university to divest from fossil fuels. Um, we have had uh, one particular thing of interest which I think changed knows a bit more about, but Stain Street Media Group, which was a, it was unofficial, but it was a, a newspaper set up by some of the students that were involved in the house as well. It was official. But it wasn't, it wasn't a... Oh. Stain Street was a registered, is a cooperative media outlet that runs a website and a newspaper and um, essentially was run as a democratic members co-op between the different individuals engaged and was essentially supposed to be like a community news source that would be able to provide free newspapers to people within Birmingham written by other members of people in Birmingham without like a hierarchical employment structure or a sort of particular political slant rather it was like a vehicle to give people a say in contemporary affairs, arts and all these sorts of things and ISP published about 10,000 issues a day but now it's mainly online Mm -hmm. Not a day, a month. <laughs> 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 that would be outrageous. Uh, so, uh, I didn't hear you say that. Uh, maybe I'd sort of lost contact with my ears for a second. But um, uh, there was also all the articles in there, obviously, fully de democratically like chosen to be in there. So it wasn't just like uh, in the Guardians, one person, or, like some of the executives, like they put it in. It was like all quite democratic, which is really good to see. Um, and yeah, our campaigns and educational events also be focused on cooperative nature. Um, one particular special relationship we've had with Cooperative is Green Bike Project in Birmingham, which sadly has actually um, folded. folded now mm -hmm. uh, uh, because of the university favouring another uh, non cooperative uh, outlet for uh, bicycles with students. But um, one, as you see, as um, we use for the shop, obviously, as well as other things, the cargo bike is of like um, unlimited like uh, novel, novel uses. Um, <laughs> And we've uh, actually been donated the uh, cargo bikes uh, to be shared with other, other cops in the community, uh, but also have it stored at our house and to be used by our house particularly as well. So we pretty much like our, we've got two cargo bikes like this now in our house, but we try and share them out with the community. So they can also do uh, what we do by transporting goods and other things for various campaigns as well as just uh, cooperative living. And one of one obvious thing that does uh, come to mind when you sort of uh, when you are a student is that you can't do anything to your house. Like really, you know, you're confined by contract. You're only there for a year anyway, so you know you can't really do much. And obviously, as Chase said, landlords typically just want to paint over stuff and hide things until next year. Um, we've actually got very very involved uh, through because of a few keen individuals, particularly this year, including myself, uh, in. 
uh, trying to do some DIY, uh, self-teaching whilst we're at it because I mean there's no one really that we can teach us what we want to do in our own house. We decide what we want to do in meetings and then we go and do it. We find ways. Uh, so some things that are very notable is that we've created, so our lounge was really, really massive, uh, definitely bigger than this, well, not, not as wide, but as longer than this room originally, to the front window, to the kitchen. And we decided, well, the last, uh, last year we decided that they wanted to build a wall uh, to make a room there, so we went from seven bedrooms to eight, which was great. And we actually went about building the whole thing ourselves. There was no structural uh, uh, changes but we just made an internal stub wall, we plastered it ourselves, painted it and everything ourselves. Uh, we just had a bit of help from an electrician to put in a light and stuff. So uh, that was also obviously made the costs really, really low, which is great and you know because we're running on a fairly tight budget. And um, yeah, so sometimes some of these things do come up very, very um, in very nice sort of ways. Uh, so also on the right there we've also got our ninth bedroom which is actually now complete, you'll see more of that a little bit later, and the greenhouse which also is very near completion. Um, we have over we have a very large garden, uh, about typically nine times bigger than the average uh, garden in Steady Oak. You can see that the end of the garden is right over there. It's a good 25, 30 meters long, uh, which is great. So we've got lots of space to do planting vegetables, and we've got a few tree, uh, some cherry, cherry tree, apple tree, and a lot of trees and bushes, and raised beds. And we try and get a uh, community involved. We've had lots of like events that we try and uh, publicise on Facebook and social media and other and other methods. And we have people that don't live there come around, and our friends and friends of families come around just to help us and also learn whilst they're at it, really, which is something that continues inside and outside the house. And one unique opportunity that came up particularly this year is that we actually have a deaf uh, student living in our house, which is actually a uh, very uh, cool if you ask me um, because firstly like I got to learn BSL free and we <laughs> we all um, live in a house where we can still like, we've, we've tried to be in, as inclusive with everyone in the house as possible and that's obviously led to uh, our husband Zoe uh, to teach us BSL so that she can communicate with us and we can also learn that as well and have also an awareness of deaf culture which is actually uh, quite a, a, a bit of a central thing that's happened at the house this year We've had film screenings, and we've had we get um, we try to get um, people from the community, like students mainly, uh, let me know from classes and just friends in general, to come round and have free British Sign Language classes uh, with Zoe or uh, Richard, another one of our tenants who knows a bit of BSL, uh, which is incredible because it's usually quite pricey. So being that it's free is quite a uh, significant thing. It also allows us to like access a communication path with Zoe far easier as well. Been very successful this year so far. Um, looking toward the future, uh, very briefly, or even slightly in the present with the first one. Uh, so, we're part of uh, a Student Book Corporation uh, as one of many members, including Edinburgh Student Housing Cooperative and uh, Sheffield Student Housing Cooperative, and many other food cooperatives, uh, bicycle cooperatives, and others, you name it. We've got it in there, uh, run by students. We've got, like, so we've got a, a body basically that unites us all in a big network across the UK. And we essentially want to uh, be a, uh, accelerate the growth of student student movement in the cooperative sector. Um, and on a more personal level, we, as James mentioned earlier, uh, want to expand in our own our own um, collection of houses in Birmingham. We want to try and um, obviously fast track our own advancement. Also, show because of the um, sorry because of the uh, model we have. Uh, in our house and how successful that is. We've not actually made a loss on any month since the beginning of operations, uh, which has been two years now, so it's not too long, but it's you know it's, it's, it's proven that our model works. Uh, to expand would be definitely the next step, so we can actually start acquiring more uh, finances to uh, continue our development as a uh, cooperative, and to basically reach out to other uh, cooperatives and help them develop themselves as well, which, is, which would be great. Um, and obviously we want to try, drive down the yeah. uh, current market as well. So okay. Do you want me to talk there? Yeah. Okay. Well, like one of the key things, um, motivations for setting up the cooperative was the idea that student housing is fundamentally exploited in terms of price and quality. And we think that by basically establishing a block of cooperative housing, as you see in many places, um, French is a noble example, but in America in particular where the student model was kicked off, we hope to push down the price of um, what you call it private housing in the Sally Oak area, which would be good for local community and students, 
as well as rugby giving him more motivation to basically force landlords to be somewhat responsible for the way they take care of their properties. So the idea here is essentially that expansion works both as a sound financial and you know long-term model for the cooperative itself, but also will impact the wider community by forcing private landlords to take seriously the needs of tenants. And if they do not, have a giving tech people and students in the community an option of going somewhere else where they can then be put directly in touch with the cooperative movement and with the cooperative alternative. So yes, this is our... Um, so uh, what's happening at the club right now? <laughs> so uh, this is a little bit outdated because this is actually um, from, uh, from the phone call at AGM which we presented at three weeks ago three or four weeks ago. Mm. And uh, so this, uh, this is a, the ninth bedroom in house. house. So the original uh, seven bedroom property we live in has actually now been up to, up to nine, which is great, 200 students per year coming into the house, learning all the stuff that we're doing and also helping us. Um, and so this room's actually complete. This is um, taken about a week before it's complete. Um, and we now have our ninth tenant living in there, which is great. And um, this, I mean, this goes to show that uh, we can expand and we've, you know, we can, with the investments we get from our partners or um, like business partners and uh, obviously other cooperatives, uh, we can, you know, we can improve the lives of, improve the lives, sorry, the, uh, improve the uh, living space of a house without like ne negatively affecting uh, communal areas and things you. like that, you know. Yeah. about doing what so many landlords do where they just send, essentially shut a room wherever they can. Instead, we had the house which came with two garages for students who don't drive. So the idea of turning one of those into a bedroom and then being able to do it, finance it, and work part financed by phone call and part financed by us, some of it, allows us to like demonstrate that we can both work in cooperation and also independently help develop the cooperative ourselves. So, and as, as you saw earlier, we've got a greenhouse, which is um, almost done. We need to just do um, the foundations on the inside because we've, we've sort of got um, some stakes in the corners. It's almost already all the panels are on. Uh, we just need to get the floor in properly, and we're done. We can put loads of uh, tomatoes, everything else in there. Increase our yield this year by probably 20 30%, which would be great. And um, one other thing that Green Bio Project are also helping us with is, um, or at least like donating their funds to us in the, in the uh, form of giving us a bike shed so that we can actually have uh, somewhere to store bikes, the tools that they had when their car was running, and so that we can actually continue their operations from our house, invite students to do another thing in our house, which is great. Uh, so it's turning into a hub of uh, different things that you can do really. And uh, yeah, I've mentioned student cooperation earlier, so I don't want to go about that too much more. I think. Ooh, that's <laughs> everything. Um, yeah, brilliant. So, James, you want to Yeah, um, <laughs> that, that slide has been slightly altered, but it comes across as just awful. Um, I don't know, I've reread it. But um, yeah, so thank you all for listening. Um, this, I feel, I chose these two images, which are very odd. Um, simply because they illustrate like the two uh, like fundamental diff aspects of the house from what I provide. One is the sort of you know improving our own conditions and you know having a bit of fun and being able to do things like constructive, i.e., building a greenhouse with people. Um, whereas the other is one of our tenants, my good friend Ros, in going to the council and making the argument for why their council should accept our planning application as to that room that was constructed because it was initially um, it was initially blocked by the conservation area on the grounds that removing an automated garage door would damage the Victorian aesthetic. <laughs> um, and which was, which was uh, quite easy to argue against, actually. Um, but yeah, but, like, but obviously whilst that is funny, <laughs> it does demonstrate that like, we, we're very serious about actually organise our time around our capabilities and what we've got to do. So if I can be here this week because I haven't got any deadlines next week, then I'll be here. But if someone else can't, then do you see what I'm saying? Is that ability of sharing labour which allows us to essentially work around the different confines people find themselves in. And that's true to both our degrees, but also health. Um, you know, if someone has a bad personal situation, let's say someone's student finance was the central bureaucratic body, cancelled it by accident, and they've got no money for two months. But then for some, we can, you know, simply say, well, when it comes in, you then pay your rent. There are ways of us being able to move around and essentially balance the needs of our memberships and the needs of the co-op so that we don't destroy either. Um, so far that works quite well.
Uh, that's really interesting. Uh, I'm a dad of two daughters who went to university. I recognise that mould. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it would appear about a week after they painted it. When, and I think for first year students who go straight into private accommodation, they don't they have know. No idea. And um, I, I found the landlords, they ripped them off on the deposits, you know, because they would keep everything back with the slightest thing that they would attach to the students. Um, how does it work in terms of the cost? You said it's one of the precepts is affordability. So. Yes. Approximately percentage wise, how much cheaper is it? Well, um, so I'll give you the average rent for a house yeah. in Sale Oak and I can give you our rent. Um, <laughs> so, an average rent for a house in Sale Oak without bills is £85 per week. We charge £59 per week. Wow. Um, our bills on top of that are obviously shared between nine people, which is quite cheap. Not that you worked this out at one point, I've forgotten the total figure. But um, compared to a, a, what you call a house in Sale Oak, where you'll be paying between maybe four people for a poorly insulated house. It works out in the favour of ours. Certainly our rent is much, much cheaper than the average and the house is much, much better. And this is one of the, the, one of the key things for me and why I got involved in this is when it came for me to move out of halls because living in halls in first year, uh, my costs were subsidised because I'm from a low income background, which means I got money off the cost. But when I had to move out into private accommodation, you know, like a house or a flat or whatever, I was suddenly faced with the fact that I couldn't really afford to live anywhere without having you know, incredibly low standards of living. So for me, this was one of the key motivations for me to get involved with is the idea of making uh, a housing alternative for students who aren't maybe from the traditional like upper or middle middle class backgrounds that so many students are from. Yeah, and uh, also, sorry, um, how do you decide who's going to be allowed to move in? It's a very good question. So what we do is we have an applications process whereby we basically we have an application form that we publicise through our various social media outlets and personally to people we know. It has a set of questions on there, everything from what do you feel you can contribute to the co-op, do you have any special access needs, um, you know, essentially a series of questions uh, to try and get an idea of how, what someone believes, like why they want to move into a cooperative, what they think they can, how they think they can help it, um, what their particular background is, what their interests are, these sorts of things. And then we, in our general meetings, which we do every week. We review them and we go through them and we sort of weigh them up and we vote on them. We decide which people we'd like to meet and which we won't. We encourage them to come around in advance and get to meet us. Mm -hmm. And obviously that's not always possible, but when it is, we really try and get that to happen because it's much better if we know them, obviously. But we do also try and avoid things like nepotism and stuff like that. We always make sure that we have a certain number of people who we definitely don't know. Because in terms of like, you don't want it to just become like, you know, your friends moving in every year and essentially creating a frat house. That's very much something we don't want to do. I just wondered uh, whether you, and I assume it's the case, that, that student, student accommodations become an industry, isn't it? So it's a big corporate in Nottingham. Christ. Yeah. Well, I mean, we saw any, some any, of it. <laughs> yeah. there's, there's, there's developments all over the place. There's just these big corporate student things. So there's, there's a kind of, kind of odd juxtaposition there. Different ethos. I wonder whether the universities kind of picked up on that. Whether, it, whether the university, or maybe the university is too closely in bed with the corporates, which was the case at the place that I used to work. Or uh, how visible are you in on the student community? Okay, so amongst the student community, we're pretty visible. I mean, uh, just yesterday I was at the uh, presidential elections for the our union, and that was the first question asked was about what they would do to support student housing cooperatives. Our, our union has policy in support of co-ops and we've had people who were involved in the project act in official roles. You were an ethical environmental officer, I was elected chair, we've had people involved in that. So we've got the union to some extent, although it's a questionable democratic body, but that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> um, they're quite they're they're reasonably good and I certainly know that the kind of this this year maybe it's just because they want to get elected but they're all very keen. Um, in terms of the university, that's a bit more of an interesting relationship because the university has a direct financial interest that is against ours, which is essentially they run a lot of private accommodation. Now, realistically, they cater to a first year market and they have to some extent a cornered market when it comes to, you know, if you're a student and you're coming from like the middle of nowhere to university, you will be in accommodation. Most students go to first year, go to student accommodation run by a university. Isn't that contracted out? Uh, so no, a small percent of it is in Birmingham University, but Birmingham University is quite a, um, how to put this, it's quite a business savvy university <laughs> and uh, it's made makes a lot of money out of its accommodation, so it has direct management over some of it. They do have subcontractors that provide halls of residence, but they don't actually go towards the University of Birmingham at all, they just work in partnership and cooperation with them. They're actually private companies like um, 
uh, like, what's the word? Victoria City, Hall. City Living. Yeah, City Living, these sorts of people. Um, however, there is an interesting point on this boom of, you know, like private student uh, housing in, in the sense of, you know, large concentrated uni units like you get with halls of accommodation. In that Edinburgh, their um, cooperative houses around 100 students, just over actually, I think, and they base theirs, they basically bought one of those halls of residence that went bust because with so many halls and all trying to charge a bit more than the other, every now and again they fall down the sinker. So it would be potentially quite a good move for us at some point to try and pick one of these up. So we're always keeping our eye on them. And if we could get, you know, an odd hundred units of accommodation and run it as a co-op, that would be very good. <laughs> so. can, can I just ask about how you relate to the neighbourhood you're based in? Because I'm aware I moved, I lived in Lenton in Nottingham, which then became student land. And eventually, when I was totally surrounded and my multicultural neighbourhood had gone, I moved to Forest Field, which I'm very pleased about. But I went to meetings of a group called NAG, and a very good, appropriate name for them, Nottingham Action Group. And they, there were a lot of people who were there who were very nimby-ish about having student housing. They were doing it from the perspective of suburban houses who didn't want one big student block in the middle of their nice houses. My approach was what's happened to my multicultural neighbourhood. I've lost it because it's now student land. But I did understand some of the things they were raising. Now, some of what you're doing is brilliant, so you'll be better looking after your house. You will not be having piles of mattresses out the front and all the rest of it. But at the same time, in terms of the neighbourhood feel, they, uh, you know, you talk to elderly people and they say, I don't know these lot, they change every year. Are you doing anything to build relationships with the community? Because what would be good, if you can't get the university on your side, is to get the council on your side. What we found was the local councillors had understood this nimbyish attitude from local older residents about keep the students out. They wouldn't have for an organisation like yourselves, I suspect. But it would you'd have to have a marketing how you relate to your neighbours, yeah? Okay, so um, I mean, <coughs> in terms of direct proximity, we have um, the Kensington Hotel, which is next door to us, which works for the Home Office as um, essentially for like people coming into the UK or having visa applications out with things like that. It acts as like a, a holding house for them, and their relationship with us is questionable, <laughs> simply because they offered to lease our house off us, make us all move out, and pay us some money, which was a bit dodgy. We said no. Um, <laughs> On the other side, however, we have like a house for. I'm just going to the immediate neighbourhood then. Yeah, yeah. Here. On the other side, we have a house for like essentially, um, it's like, you know, a halfway house for vulnerable people coming out of care, jail, etc. Mm -hmm. And we've got quite a good relationship with them. They're lovely, we talk to them, well, at least I do. Um, they, we always ask them if before we do anything, like, you know, a party or anything, they're always more than happy. No complaints whatsoever. In terms of the broader community, though, um, we've had engagement with councillors, mm -hmm. and me personally, I'm like quite politically active in. Certain political party, which <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, uh, yeah, and like we, they are all right. But the problem is, really, is that they're sort of in a bit of a tough position because the student community at large and the major forces in the area economically aren't really kind of in opposition to a cooperative. Mm -hmm. But we have tried to take an active role in publicising ourselves around us. You know, we have um, at least four houses on the same road of us, we regularly see the members that they come and go from our town, from our house all the time, you know, 970, 930, uh, the other one, 960, yeah. And we do try and like, you know, broaden this out into, um, we've got a good relationship with other co-ops in the area, it's, uh, the Bike Foundry, for example, which isn't to be a new degree bike project, and also um, the Federici Cooperative, which is soon to be set up by some graduates, uh, the Radical Roots Cooperative, I believe, and, um, we're also, we try and engage with things like Cops West Midlands and other Birmingham projects, which are a lot of, like um, Got Food Not Bombs, which is, you know, like a uh, sort of homeless, like, uh, food scheme. And we do try and do things like the Friday dinners to, like, bring in as many people from inside our, our like, student bubble, but also from outside. But the problem you have with, like, Sally Oak in particular is that in many ways, the student onslaught has kind of already happened. Yeah. The local community, in my eyes at least, uh, used to have a large like Irish working class community, has largely been decimated in terms of like the actual demographics of the town because the university and the students being there pretty much priced a lot of people out, and then the actual community itself became quite undesirable to live in, in large parts due to you know, as we talked about before, you know, the terrorist housing, the degeneration of local areas, and things like that. So. There's more to be done though. I would like to see more engagement with some of the local businesses because I know some of the like 
people who work in various places, you know, like Spa and Lloyds, and they're, they're actually quite active in the community. But there is a problem in that, because of it being a student town, the, a lot of the local community associations, like Conservation Association and things like that, are very much, I would say, anti-student, mm -hmm. and their attitude to us has been quite bad, in the sense that, you know, they reject, they've gone and blocked the planning applications without even looking at them. They've made, they've made, you know, like, um, essentially they've caused, they slowed down the construction of a room for one, someone who we, you know, one of our tenants, for months and months, and for no good reason, they could have just asked us, they just phoned us up, we could have dealt with it. But we are looking to expand this further and try and, you know, really engage with, hopefully, people in the local area who actually just live there, but it is difficult to find, sadly. It is one of the areas I think we're probably not doing as well as we should be on. I think it's an interesting challenge because I'm having moved from an area that's now 90% student, so the few residents who are left behind, I felt I was deserting when I moved out because they were older than me, and they were going, you know, 10 houses each direction are student houses, and yet there is a role that a good student house could be delivering for what's left of that community, well, and that would win over the councillors because they're very aware that now with the new registering to vote situation, it may be that they're not going to get many votes from students, but the left behind ones and elderly are most likely to vote. Well, that is that is true. But we've had I mean we've had good engagement with um, councillors, and you know um, they've come they've visited us, they've you know been our opening event, mm -hmm. and um, we've seen them. I've seen some of them personally. They are aware that um, minister, members of parliament are usually quite elusive because of the nature of being members of parliament. However, um, we have had some praise from them. But I do think um, what I'd like to see is sort of some suggestions, uh, maybe people can help with this, on how to engage with like, essentially the body of people, because we're somewhat on the periphery of the town. Do you know anyone here know? But, I mean, you know Birmingham, but we're sort of an, on the Sully Park area, which goes off towards Kings Heath and Mosley and a few other places. And I'd like to see a, like, a way of bringing people from a community beyond the town we're just in, sort of, which is Sully Oaks, but I'm not sure how to achieve that. That's like a question I've been wondering about for a while now. And we do a lot of activism and political projects, but that's also not really the same as actual community engagement in some ways. I think Laura's had done some impressive stuff, which is sort of on that area, with the CMAC and the English as a second language conversation and that sort of stuff. I've been to that road, I've been to Gun Hall. Oh, yes, yeah, so I know. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's just a big road. <laughs> and in fact, like, I was on the bus, and it's not like Forest Fields. Right. It's a very, it's very it's odd. Three or four I mean, we are we are on a massive A road, and mm -hmm. the houses on it are well. There's no like central anything. It's really weird. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. yeah. kind of. I mean, I love the house, but walking to and from university every day is soul crushing. Mm -hmm. but, uh, <laughs> maybe that's university. Sorry. Thank you. It was absolutely mm -hmm. fascinating, mm -hmm. and I think um, your passion, your knowledge, and the experience you've gained, it needs to be carried forward and, and to help. So this. Sort of this federation, this national body. Um, I have engaged with them. I'm going to be helping and supporting them. Um, and also, um, it's a shame I haven't been here. I have emailed them a few times, but there are some students in Nottingham looking to develop. Oh, they do mm -hmm. Yeah, Matthew and Scott, I think, are the name. So I don't know why they're not here because they, they didn't answer my last two messages. And they're going, oh, stay away, crazy woman. <laughs> but um, hopefully, you know, we'll if we can have your presentation, I'll probably done on our website. And, and we've been filming, but it shares the information because that's a mine of information. But not only that, it's so inspirational and, and it's so, I don't know, just heartwarming that young people are coming forward that get it and, and see the potential in it. Because it's been a long haul for quite a while and sometimes you just think, oh, you know, there's only hope out there. So you've given me loads of hope that there is hope, you know, but it's Bless well you. done. Thank you. I was just going to do a tiny bit about Abundant Earth, but it's, it's, um, it's time and um, we've already covered it. So the video that I, I had done was one I'd just taken, it was for um, a Spark Unlimited grant, which is a very unusual pot of money because individuals can get it. And um, we're hoping to get, if we're successful, £5,000 that will go towards our legal fees. So we've got land earmarked and if we get this money this will give us a you know, step up to actually get a project going in Lincolnshire. So um, if anybody is interested, because I realise a lot of people say, oh, if I shouldn't go. <laughs> but if anybody's interested in new start and the, the setup phase of doing housing properties, 
But then I'm happy to help any pastor. We have open source data. We, we share all the knowledge that we've got. And I brought all sorts of learning bits along um, to show people who are interested. But there's loads out there. So on housing, um, co-housing, cooperative housing, international community students, a whole lot. It's just share, inspire, and just do it. And, and be the change that we want to see in the world. That's the key. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming along today, uh, for staying, and for <laughs> taking part. Those that came to the first meeting as well, which I say is up to anybody and everybody. Um, and I hope that our next uh, subject, which is full for May, is diversity. We're looking at issues around diversity. Um, the suffragette movement at the start uh, has been the cooperative um, ethos of language around signing up for people's rights. Um, so that um, will be in Leicester somewhere, just got to sort out the venue, but the information will come out for that very soon. Hopefully, we'll see you again. Thank you, Angela, for organising today. Yeah. 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 Never leave this morning. Thank you. Thank you. There's loads of food, so there's maybe about a dozen people that didn't make it today. <laughs> so there are some serviettes, so please take food away with you, especially when you're four starring students. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, y